Rice has long been a staple of the Bidayu people in Borneo, as with the rest of Asia since time immemorial. Over many generations, Bidayu have developed a holistic traditional knowledge of their lands, natural resources and environment. These cultural and traditional practices usually involve the utilization of natural resources and play a part in their livelihood strategies and daily activities such as farming, hunting, fishing, home building and handicraft. I don't see farming as part of the British culture. It is the British culture itself. Without farming, we are nobody today. What else that we can have during the traditional era? The only one is farming, petty farming. So we can say that farming was really, really the main core of the, uh, their livelihood or their everyday business. I'm proud to say we are hardworking people. Yeah? It has been proven from those days in those days, there is no such thing as plentiful of rice or plentiful of, I mean, essential things. We work from early in the morning to late in the evening, looking for something for us to fill our stomach for that day. That is, guys, pagi makan pagi, guys, petang makan petang lah. That is from hand to mouth. Yeah. The Bidayas, Bidayas are paddy planters. Yeah? To plant paddy, you need virgin soil. To look for fertile soil, you need virgin soils. And then in farming, we do slash and burn. Yeah? Actually, most of the other elements in the lives of the Bidayas are basically related to farming. For example, most of their rituals, their ceremonies and so on were basically very much related to farming. The first one would be cutting the undergrowth. So we would go and bring our very sharp bukuaratok, uh, we call it the pinyawa, which is the bidayo meshet or parang. And we would clear the undergrowth first. Uh, after that, we would cut the medium-sized trees and the bigger-sized trees will uh, fail them. And uh, of course, some of the trees would be too big to be cut. So we would climb and, and just cut, trim the branches, prune the branches, and uh, we'll just leave the main tree trunk that was called Raba. We call it Rabala in Penyawa. And after that, we would wait for probably one month to let all the wood, all what we have cut down, to be really dry before we do the burning. So the next step would be the burning season, whereby, uh, uh, as far as I remember, the whole village would, would go to the area, to the farming area, and we would spread out, you know, some people would be guarding the fire to prevent it from spreading too far uh, to the extent of even bringing some water and uh, some would be assigned to bring some fire torches to burn or to light up the wood. It was really fun, the time was a fun time where we got very excited uh, there were a lot of screams and a lot of shouting because the whole area would be engulfed with fire and you can see, we could see big flames and uh, smoke rising into the air. So that was burning season. After the burning season, we would leave the, the farm area which has been scorched by fire and the soil would still be very hot. 
we would leave it for probably one or two days. And after that, we would go to do planting. When you do slash and burn or slash, clear, fell down and burn, it needs at least seven years for the land to be grown to fully fertile, fertile jungle or fertile soils for us to be able to recultivate again. The next step would be waiting for the paddy to grow, you know, the seedling to sprout and become uh, young uh, paddy seedlings. And then uh, when to a certain height, we would go and do the weeding. And that was the time many of us would spend uh, our time, maybe one or two or three weeks in the paddy field itself. We would uh, go from the kampong and would stay there just to do the weeding. And after the weeding was done, there would be some kind of wait, waiting time while the paddy grow to the time until they bear fruit and also waiting for the time when it would be fit for harvest. So during that period of time, uh, the Bidaya would be doing something else like hunting or making baskets and so on. Activities just to fill their time while waiting for the harvesting season. So when the paddy ripens, we would go and harvest the paddy. So harvesting would be the last part of the paddy planting season and uh, we would celebrate that harvest with our gawai and that was why we had gawai initially it was actually a celebration after harvest and that is why the people put high regard honor and respect on every grain of paddy that we collected from our farm without the paddy we will be starving without the paddy there is no way that we can continue to live in the next, in the years to come. And that is where, that is where the Bria people in the olden days will go as far as any virgin jungle to farm, to come up with big return of paddy, because to them it is their survival. In most cases, uh, the bidaya would plant enough rice for them to survive until the next planting season. Uh, however, because of certain factors, for example, uh, attacks from locusts or attacks from uh, swarms or bird, we call it peat, sometimes there would be too many of them. So they would just fly and they would eat up our paddy grain. So the harvest would be quite poor. Other uh, factors would be because of very long period of heavy rain during the harvesting season. So it would affect the paddy, the, the grains would just fall and uh, we had no time to pick them because of the rain or we picked them and we couldn't dry them properly because there was not enough sunlight. So due to those factors, we may have poor harvest. So because of that, we would have to resort to other uh, kinds of uh, alternative foods. Midway, we have running out of stock of the paddy what will be the survival of the entire family. The only resort is go for tapioca, go for sagu to survive until we harvest the paddy in the next season. Most of them would be like uh, tapioca. We would plant tapioca, or we call it in Penyawa, Bandung. We would eat the tapioca in different forms, of course cooked in different uh, ways and, and prepared in different ways to produce uh, 
tapioca based food. Besides tapioca, we also would resort to maize, or we call it jagung. Because during the planting of our paddy, our dry paddy, there would be some other crops that would be planted together in the paddy field itself. For example, we, we would plant a lot of this uh, labu or water guard or labu kuning and we would plant uh, maize. There's another uh, crop similar to maize, we call them jerry. Lah. Jerry, we call it jerry, it's more like the oat planted by the orang putih. Lah. Other food that we resorted to is like sago or we call it sagu because uh, in the Bidayo area, in their village vicinity, especially near the small streams or swamps, they would, we would have a lot of these uh, sago palms and we would just go and cut them and then uh, extract the starch from the sago palm. So it was one of our alternative food source. The Bidaya's main uh, food is rice. However, they cannot just eat rice, but they eat rice with other food like meat, fish, vegetables and fruits. The Bidayo also use to their advantage their knowledge of the habits of wild animals to help deter them from disturbing the paddy plants. Different types of vegetation are planted alongside the crop to divert the animals from eating the paddy. Truly ingenious for the Bidayu to find a different way to handle pests that might destroy their crops. Hunting was also a source of food for the Bidayu. Living mainly in the hilly areas of the mountains, the Bidayu were surrounded by thick virgin forests which supplied them with wild animals suitable for consumption. Hunting was the method used to get these animals on the dinner table. So that is actually, to me, the culture, the survival of the Bidayu people in the earlier era. That is uh, to supplement, and of course, uh, uh, hunting, fishing, because we cannot uh, go by just rice alone in the meal. All these things have to come in, uh, and that is where they have all the creativities to earn or to collect fish from the river, to hunt in the jungle. But basically, that does not guarantee the survival. It is still the farming circle is the one that actually makes them survive. So I would say it's due to the need for survival. And also after that, they must have used a lot of imagination and their experience in farming. Because they had to use the materials which they could find as they were doing the farming to make traps for animals and also even to catch fish from the rivers or streams. Besides also they do hunting. They do hunting during that time they are plentiful for animals, not like nowadays. They do traps, they don't have guns, but they do traps, yeah? S uh, animal traps, squirrel traps. That is how they go hunting. If I try to recall or even ask the older generation how they started making traps, I don't think they could really explain it well. But what I can think of is the need to survive. Because long ago, they were, they were not accessible to 
big towns or cities, they couldn't go to the markets to buy meat or fish. So I think the Bidaya must have uh, thought and thought how they could catch the animals. They must have observed the animals and then they must have given a lot of thoughts into how they could catch them. The Bidaya actually have many different kinds of traps which are still used even until today. However, there are some very common ones. For example, uh, one of the most common which is used to trap animals even in the surrounding uh, village area is the trap which is for catching squirrel. In Bidaya, Penyawa, we call it the tiku, which is a trap made from a, about a bamboo, about one fathom in length, the one that has a spring rod. At the end of one end of the spring rod is attached snail line, which at the end of it is a noose. The noose is the one that will trap the animal uh, either on the leg or on the body, around the body or around the neck. So when the animal come near, hit the trigger and the trigger is released, then the animal is being trapped by the noose. These are for small animals like uh, squirrels, uh, the jungle rats, which are edible animals and also for small animals like mouse deer or even birds like the kruak or the water birds. The other trap is of course uh, almost the same but this is more to the one which has stronger spring rod and normally this spring rod is planted to the ground or tied to a tree. So for this one they normally have another line which will hold the uh, trigger. So this this trigger will be attached to a line and then normally we will pull down this trigger to be attached to a, a hook which is planted to the ground and uh, the end of it, the noose, will be either put uh, along the path of the animal so when the animal walks through, the trigger will be released and so the end, the springboard will just spring up, pulling the hoop and trap the animal, either on the neck or on the legs. This one can be used for slightly bigger animals like the deer, uh, even the wild boar, or the reindeer, or these uh, anteaters etc. Uh, the next kind of tra trap is the deadfall uh, trap. For this kind of trap, uh, they have the same thing. They, all, they also have the uh, snail line, but now the snail line is not attached to the uh, spring rod, but instead it is attached to, to one load. It's either a log or a piece of rock and so it it holds the log and the rock and at the end of that snail line there is a trigger which is attached to the path of the animal so what happens is when the animal pass by the trigger is being released and the the weight just now, the rock or the log, will just drop on the animal and so the animal is being trapped. Uh, these ones are normally for wild boar, for example, or even bigger animals like the bear. Normally those animals that crawl quite low, not for those animals like the deer,
Uh, there's a type of or method of fishing where the Bidaya use the bubu. In Pinyawa dialect, the bubu is, we call it ju, J-U, which is a, a fish trap made from bamboo. So normally what we did was we would bring the ju or the bubu to a stream and place it in such a way that the mouth of the bubu will be facing the opposite, the current flow. So normally what the fish do during the night especially is they would go up the river or the stream. That is the nature of the fish movement. They, they love to go from down river going up. And so the bubu is normally being placed with some rocks or branches or leaves. So they will just go inside the trap and then in the end they couldn't find their way out because, because of the nature of the fish trap or the jew or the bubu. Throughout the generations, Bidayu have become very adept with their natural surroundings. Even in the early days, Bidayu knew to respect the forest and to take only what was needed. A clear example would be the Bidayu vine tea or Bekah Beras. The Biana tribe from Anah Rais still enjoy this drink till this day. The method of harvesting this tea is still done in the same traditional way. The vine is found to grow quite commonly within the forest and in abundance. This is due to the way the Bidayu traditional knowledge has been passed down through generations. The bark is removed using a method that does not kill the plant but allows it to regrow and thrive. It is amazing to know that such sustainable techniques existed way back in the early days of the Bidayu. A little food for thought as to why the Bidayu thrive till this day and beyond.